today we're going to talk about some really big stuff. Cosmology. It's the study of the structure of the universe. What are its origins? What does it look like today? And where is it headed? What's the fate of the cosmos as a whole? Now, it might seem at first glance like talking about cosmology is completely disconnected from particle physics. In fact, as disconnected as you could imagine. We've gone from the tiniest of the tiny to the largest of, the, of all possible things we could study. And one of the beautiful things, it's very elegant and very surprising, is that these two branches of physics are very intimately connected. It has been this way for a long time, and more so today than ever before. You need to understand particle physics to talk about the structure of the universe, and vice versa. What the cosmologists are learning about the structure of the universe is teaching us about limits of the standard model. One way of thinking about it is if the universe begins in some cataclysmic Big Bang, that's an extremely high energy, high temperature event. And high energies correspond in quantum mechanics to small distances. Everything was really close together. In a sense, the universe was tiny at the moments of the Big Bang, and so particle physics becomes extremely important if you want to understand where everything begins, how the universe starts. You really need to understand the rules and the constituents so that you have a sense of what's going to happen next. So I want to begin today by saying a little bit about the Big Bang, because it's a pretty wild theory. It's been around for a long time, and I want to discuss it as a scientific question, so not as a, um, an issue of sort of a mm, creation myth, um, but rather as a creation scenario that can be tested. Logical consequences, mathematical structure, and then is there data to confirm this hypothesis? So why do we believe in the Big Bang? Let me, there are many reasons, and let me begin by giving you sort of what I consider to be the three best arguments for this idea of the origin of the universe. First of all, Imagine that you're an astronomer looking at stars. Now, if we lived in a kind of a static universe, a universe that's very, very large, possibly even infinite, and has been here forever, then you would expect to see a bunch of stars out there, some of them running towards us, some of them running away from us, moving every which way. It should be some sort of a distribution of velocities out there. Now, we can figure out the speed of a star. It's not, at first glance, obvious how you would do that, you use a simple physics effect called the Doppler effect, which you may have noticed if you're standing on a street corner and a police car or an ambulance goes by, and you listen to the siren, it makes that characteristic, first a high pitch when it's coming towards you, and then a low pitch as it runs away, and whee, as it goes by. And that effect, the Doppler effect, is completely understood. It's just a simple wave phenomenon. If the source of a wave is coming towards you, it shifts up in frequency. If it's running away from you, it shifts down in frequency. And light is also a wave phenomenon. Everything is both particle and wave. And in particular, light has many, many properties which are just completely understandable in terms of waves. If an object is glowing and it runs away from you, the color is just shifted a little bit. If it's running away from you, it's shifted a little bit more towards the red. If it's running towards you, shifted just a little bit more towards the blue in the spectrum. So if you look at stars carefully and you measure their color, you can deduce their relative motion towards you or away from you. And what was noticed long time ago was that if you start looking at far away objects, stars in galaxies, they all appear to be running away from us. And that's true in any portion of the sky, northern hemisphere, southern hemisphere, all directions, all the galaxies that we can see appear to be running away from us, and the farther away they are, the faster they seem to be running away from us. Now think about that for a second. It's a weird concept. And you can imagine the reaction of astronomers and physicists when they first started collecting this data. Edwin Hubble is famous for making the first experimental measurements of this effect. We've named the Hubble telescope after him in honor of this discovery. You might first think, wow, we're really special. We must be at the center of the universe and everything is rushing away from us. I think that's it's a possible explanation, but it really doesn't seem all that likely. And it doesn't really explain why things that are farther away from us are running away even faster still. There is actually a simpler explanation and it requires a kind of a, 
an abstract conception of the universe as a whole. So let me, let me simplify the universe for a moment. And instead of thinking of it as three-dimensional, think of it as two-dimensional. So imagine that we live on the surface of some giant ball, like a big balloon. So you paint little galaxies on the balloon, and we are little ants crawling around on the surface of this balloon. So I've reduced our universe to two dimensions, and those two dimensions curve around in the shape of a ball. If that balloon is expanding, somebody is blowing it up, then all the little spots on it are moving apart from one another. Every individual ant is moving away from every other little individual ant on the surface of that balloon. And if you could put yourself in the worldview of one of those ants, what would you see? You would look around you, and in every direction you would see other ants, and they're all moving away from you, and the farther away they are, the faster they move. If they're twice as far away, they move away from you twice as rapidly. So every ant has a worldview that's the same as the one that we are presently observing. So this makes us not special. It makes the universe quite symmetrical, and it also explains this fact that double the distance corresponds to double the speed. So this is really the, the origin, I think, of this idea of a Big Bang. The universe is expanding. So run the clock backwards. If stars are running away from us now, where were they a week ago? Well, they must have been a little bit closer to us. And keep running the clock backwards, and now plug in some numbers. Look at how far away they are, and how fast they're moving, and ask, how long ago was it when that faraway galaxy was right next to us, if it's been doing this motion for a long time? And the answer nowadays is about 15 billion years ago. About 15 billion years is the amount of time it takes for a galaxy which is presently at its observed distance and observed velocity to have started off right next to us. Now you look at another galaxy at a different distance and you do that calculation, you get the same number. That's again a very interesting and compelling observation. Every galaxy, every star that's far away appears to have been very close to us about 15 billion years ago. So what does that mean? It means that 15 billion years ago the whole universe was in some highly compressed, very small state. And this is the idea of the Big Bang. We begin with everything really close together. All of the energy of the universe was there from the beginning. Energy is conserved. So if you think about that, it means that in the beginning you have this very tiny, very energetic situation, which is the Big Bang. Now, we don't yet have any of the details of the Big Bang, but this is the sort of origins of the idea. So let's just now play the science game of what if. Okay, what if there was a Big Bang? How could you demonstrate that this is really true? Well, the idea would be draw some conclusions and then check to see if those conclusions are satisfied in the world. So, For example, if the universe begins very hot, hot things glow, always. This is a law of physics. They emit radiation. And so this early Big Bang, it's a big explosion. There should be light, among other things. There should be light, which was emitted from that explosion. And if this Big Bang scenario says the universe is symmetrical, then that radiation should be emitted in all directions. So any direction that you look, you should be able to see the afterglow. Right? You've got a big explosion, and then it begins to cool down. And if it's just an expanding object, the laws of thermodynamics tell you how rapidly it will cool down. So you should be able to predict how hot is the residual of this explosion now, 15 billion years later. And you come to a conclusion. It's a quantitative conclusion. If we began with an explosion 15 billion years ago, then the temperature today should be, and you can express it as an energy or what's better is a, a temperature. The universe should be at a certain temperature. And so we've gone out and looked. In fact, the first observation of this was n not intentional. It was accidental. Penzias and Wilson in the early 60s observed this afterglow, just some radiation coming towards us from all directions, deep outer space. In fact, this radiation is coming essentially from the farthest you can possibly look. And it appears as though we are inside of a giant box, if you wish, that's got a certain uniform temperature. So this is very compelling evidence that that scenario fits. And that background radiation, it's called the cosmic background radiation, sometimes called the cosmic microwave background, because it's really not very hot anymore. The universe has cooled down so much 
that the radiation is very long wavelength, very low energy radiation. It's not visible to the eye. You don't see a glow anymore. It's like an old fire. It starts off white hot and then it's red hot. And as it cools, you can't see it with your eyes anymore, but you can still put your hands over it and feel that there is radiation coming out. And now we've waited for 15 billion years. And of course, it's just a steady process of getting colder and colder, but it's never going to be at zero. It's just approaching zero. And uh, the old data of Penzias and Wilson was very crude, just a couple of data points indicating that there seemed to be this microwave radiation. We're like living in a very giant, fairly cold microwave oven in a certain sense. And nowadays, there's much improved data. I will tell you about some of that shortly. Um, we've sent satellites up into orbit to get away from the noise and heat of planet Earth and taken very, very careful measurements. And so far, it works like a champ. This idea that you're looking at a black, dark, but warm object is consistent with the data at very high levels of accuracy. The third piece of evidence that I want to mention for why we might believe that the universe begins in this cataclysm, this Big Bang, is the following. Let's now apply the laws of particle physics, the standard model, to that early universe. What we have is a big particle physics accelerator experiment. Very high energy, very high densities, and we should be able to calculate, if our model is correct, well, what do you produce? You produce electrons and positrons and protons and antiprotons, and some of those protons will smash together because it's very hot, just like they do today in the core of the sun, and form heavier elements. And so you should be able to calculate all of the nucleosynthesis, the creation of elements in those early minutes of the universe. So you sit down and work out the details. How much hydrogen do you expect compared to how much helium, compared to how much lithium, and so on. And the predictions are that uh, you shouldn't have very many heavy elements because the cataclysm was very rapid. It's not like the sun that's been running for billions of years cooking, if you like. And uh, here you just have a very brief explosion and then everything spreads apart. So you only have a short amount of time to create some heavier elements. And again, we have gone out, astronomers have looked. Typically what you do is you look not towards stars, but out into the dark spaces between the stars and between the galaxies. And there's evidence for dust. The light that comes through that dust gets absorbed and indicates what is the dust made of. And it appears to be made in precisely, well, that material is precisely what we expect from this Big Bang scenario. So these are quantitative predictions that are then verified by the data. So I think today the Big Bang scenario is accepted. It is not quite as rigorously accepted as the standard model of particle physics itself because the amount of data that's consistent with particle physics is enormous. And the amount of data associated with the Big Bang is smaller in number and more difficult. This uh, astronomical observations are more challenging. So I think it's a good theory, very well believed, but more subject to modification and new ideas than the standard model of particle physics itself. Let me tell you a little bit more about what's going on today, because we've been sending up satellites and we continue to do so. And in particular, this cosmic background radiation is turning out to be just a wonderful tool to learn about this early event, this Big Bang. The first great satellite to do this was called COBE, the Cosmic Background um, Explorer is the acronym. And COBE went up in the late 80s and made measurements for a couple of years. And if you look at the data, it's just so beautiful. There's a theoretical expectation. It's called the black body curve. And the data just lies on that curve so well that you can't even see the uncertainties. They're so small on a graph that they just fit right into the line that you draw through the data points. What they observed was some interesting facts. For example, the radiation that you see from one part of the sky is pretty much exactly identical to the radiation you see from another part of the sky. Now realize you're looking back in time, 15 billion years. This is radiation that was emitted 15 billion years ago in the Big Bang and has traveled towards us ever since and something that comes from one side of the universe and that comes from the other side of the universe and reaches us is identical. Now that's a very interesting sort of thought provoking. It implies that the universe began all together in one spot 
because that's the only way you could imagine that stuff over there and stuff elsewhere would know what the temperature is supposed to be. They agree spectacularly. And how about variations? When you look in light, you see galaxies here and then no galaxy and then galaxy and then no galaxy. The universe is clumpy. And we would like to understand the clumpiness, right? This is part of cosmology, is understanding the structure of the universe that we live in. Where do galaxies come from? Well, presumably, there was some region of dust and gas that coalesced by gravity and began to form stars. And now you ask, well, why are some parts, some parts of the galaxies more dense and other parts less dense? And so you kind of work your way backwards. You say, well, in the early universe, there must have been some fluctuations. Some parts were a little bit more dense and some parts were a little bit less dense and the parts that were more dense attracted and so they got even more and more and so you have a kind of a feedback which forms galaxies. So this is a, a model of gal galactic formation and you have to ask yourself, is this consistent with the Big Bang scenario? If the Big Bang is really completely uniform, then you'd have this explosion of dust and gas that's completely uniform and then you wouldn't have any mechanism for galaxy formation. So people have been continuing to look at this data and have noticed that there are, in fact, tiny variations. Although it's almost completely uniform, there is a little bit more density here and there and a little bit less density in other places. And it is quite consistent with what you would need in the early universe to have a later universe that clumped into galaxies the way ours has. So even more quantitative data indicating that this Big Bang scenario is correct. This is a very hot field of research. There are balloons that have been sent up with ob observers. There are satellites that are being launched and will be launched in the near future. They all have acronyms. Boomerang is one of the balloon experiments, and Planck and MAP are some of the satellite experiments. And you'll probably be hearing about these things because they are taking very precise data, and now we can start to compare with the standard model, or perhaps even something deeper than the standard model, because where do those fluctuations come from? In the standard model, you have some, you can't have perfect uniformity. The Heisenberg uncertainty principle says there will always be fluctuations. Little particle-antiparticle pair will appear here, but not there. And there are calculations you can do, statistical calculations. What is the probability of getting a high density region here and a smaller density region there? So one can actually connect this physics of the cosmos to the standard model and make numerical quantitative predictions of what do you expect for those little teeny quantum fluctuations that happen during the Big Bang and then get magnified by gravity over the years, first turning into the observable fluctuations in the cosmic background radiation and ultimately the fluctuations that we see, here's a galaxy and there's empty space. As we collect this data, there are many puzzles remaining. Our picture of cosmology is still, I would say, at a more primitive state than our, than our picture of the standard model of particle physics itself. There's a lot of mysterious stuff out there that we would love to understand and we don't yet. For example, the dark matter. Let me tell you about what dark matter is because it, it's cosmological in origin but maybe particle physics in action, another connection between the very large and the very small. There are many evidences, scientific data points, that point to the existence of something out there in outer space that doesn't glow. We can't see it directly. We only infer its existence. Let me give you a simple example, although there are many of these. If you look at a galaxy, there's always some outlying stars. And those outlying stars are all, almost always in some kind of orbit. And by making careful measurements, we can deduce the speed and the orbital path of those stars. Now we have a theory of gravity. In fact, you can use Newton's law of gravity and usually that's good enough. Albert Einstein's theory of gravity pretty much isn't even necessary. You could use it, but it's gonna give you essentially the same results as good old Isaac Newton. If you watch an object in orbit, you can conclude by making measurements of its orbit, what is the mass in the middle that's making it go in that orbit? We can figure out the mass of the sun without actually going and putting it on a scale by looking at planet Earth or any of the planets and seeing what our orbital motion is. It's just the laws of physics that tell you that. So you look at these stars and you calculate how much mass is there inside of their orbit 
that's attracting them, preventing them from running off in a straight line. And you get a big number. And now you look with your telescopes and you count all the stars in the galaxy and you add up the mass of all those stars and it doesn't even come close to what you expected. It's like 1% of what you expected. It's really radically far away. It's not, you know, astronomers have difficult times. You can't really count all the stars individually. You could imagine factors of two mistakes, but not a factor of 100. So apparently there's something else inside the galaxy which is massive, which is gravitating, and yet it's not glowing. Now you might say, well, but there's dust, and there is dust, but we know that there's dust. We can measure how much dust there is, because dust absorbs light. So if you emit light, or if you absorb light, we will be able to detect it, and we wouldn't call it dark matter. So this is something else. It's something very exotic. What is it? Well, we don't know, right? This is one of the big puzzles of cosmology, and uh, everybody's busy trying to figure out what is the dark matter. There are lots of ideas. And it might be just a bunch of, I don't know, protons and neutrons, maybe even forming little clumps of matter, some little charcoal blocks out there, with, which are somehow just not absorbing the, the sunlight. Dust is visible because it absorbs light but allows some to pass through. If it was really black, we might not really be able to notice, if it, notice it if it was also really small. Well, that's a possibility, but now you start doing some calculations, and this Big Bang scenario doesn't predict that. And I told you that we think we understand how much matter there was formed in the Big Bang, and the matter that was formed, the ordinary quarks and the electrons, leptons, and all the ordinary stuff, adds up to about 1% of what seems to be out there. So what else could it be? Could it be anything else? Well, we already have some candidates. What about neutrinos? The universe is filled with neutrinos. Every star makes them. The Big Bang made them. There's a big, large density of neutrinos everywhere. And imagine for a moment that those neut neutrinos are massive. This is a possibility in particle physics. It's something that we're investigating actively today in the laboratory. If the neutrino is massive, you add up all these tiny numbers and you get a big number and that would be something that gravitates there might be more neutrinos in the region of galaxies because there's lots of gravity there and if they're massive they might actually be attracted it's an idea and again you have to ask yourself well can we verify this idea it turns out that the neutrinos cannot explain all the dark matter that we believe is out there they might explain a tiny fraction of it We've already put limits. The neutrino can't weigh a pound. It's a tiny object. In fact, we have very, very stringent limits. It's an extraordinary light object. And so it's just not enough mass sitting in the neutrinos to explain all the dark matter that we've hypothesized is there in order to explain other phenomena which we really can see, like the rotation of stars, the expansion of the galaxy, uh, galaxies as a whole, all sorts of data that points to dark matter, and it points to the same amount of dark matter. So what else could it be? Well, maybe there's yet other undiscovered particles, like supersymmetric particles. We've talked about those briefly. It's a very speculative idea. It's a new form of matter. These squarks and the sleptons and these crazy particles that are predicted by string theory, and people have been looking for them very actively at particle physics accelerators, if it's real, we hope to find evidence of it in future upcoming generations of particle physics accelerators. And if there really are supersymmetric particles, they too would exist in the universe. They would have been created in the Big Bang, which is a giant accelerator experiment 15 billion years ago. And some of them might still be sitting around, gravitating. So all of this kind of speculation is very tentative, and it hooks together astronomy, cosmology, particle physics, everybody's working together to try to understand what this stuff is. I think that this is, you know, there's going to be lots of progress. I can't imagine that over the next 10 or 15 years there's not going to be some great discoveries that will teach us more about what this dark matter is. And uh, so that's something to keep your eyes open for. The mysteries don't end here with the dark matter. There is another phenomenon going on which is quite recently observed and it's, it's even more mysterious than the dark matter. I think we can imagine 
some new undiscovered particles out there and uh, we can go look for them. There's another phenomenon that happened in the early universe and it's happening again now and it's got the cute name inflation. So think of the Big Bang. The naive image of a Big Bang is just an explosion. And it turns out if you work out the details consistent with the, all the data that I've been talking about, in particular this cosmic background radiation data, it looks now like what you really need in the beginnings of the Big Bang is a very rapid explosion. You need some supply of energy which inflates the universe very rapidly for a very short amount of time. This inflationary scenario explains a lot of things, including the fact that the universe looks so much the same in all directions. Now, where would that energy come from? Well, I can propose a mechanism consistent with the standard model of particle physics. I'm not suggesting that this is the right explanation. There are some detailed problems with it, but it might be the right conceptual explanation. Remember the Higgs particle, this bizarre part of the standard model. It is conventional physics right now. Although we don't have direct evidence for the existence of the Higgs, there's a lot of indirect evidence, and we're looking for one. The main thing, the weirdest thing about the Higgs is that it's everywhere. It's a, we call it a condensed out field. There is actually a non-zero value of the Higgs field everywhere. We're swimming through this stuff. And that's why particles have mass, is because they're swimming through this Higgs field. It's not a bunch of Higgs particles. Particles would be excitations or waves in that field. It's just the field itself. Now, if this field exists everywhere in the universe, where did it come from? The idea in the standard model is it condensed out. It's like water vapor that you cool, and as you cool it, it undergoes a phase change, and all of a sudden you've got liquid water. So you ask, where did the water come from? Well, it originated in this beautiful symmetrical gas, and then, as it cooled, it condensed out. It's the same with the Higgs. We imagine that in the early universe, at the start of the Big Bang, it's very symmetrical. All the theories unify. The electric and the weak forces are the same, in nature, and the Higgs particle is not yet condensed out. And then, as the universe expands and cools, the Higgs field condenses out. And what happens when a gas condenses into a liquid? It emits some heat, some thermal energy. Farmers know about this if they've got a crop of orange trees in Florida and they're worried about a freak cold snap. They'll put buckets of water underneath the trees so that if the water freezes, the emitted heat will prevent the oranges from all freezing and dying. It's a standard and understood physical phenomenon. You are releasing some latent heat. And as the Higgs field condenses, it too would release some form of latent heat. That's a supply of energy. It's not creating energy out of nothing. It was there as potential, and it's become manifest. But that release of heat would pour energy into all the particles, which would then expand very rapidly. This is a scenario that is consistent with particle physics that would explain this cosmological inflation that the cosmologists independently postulated for other reasons and believe they have evidence is, is real, it really happened. In fact, the new data from some of these balloon observatories is that it's happening again. The universe, you might expect we had a big bang, everything is expanding, but the expansion should be slowing down because everything's gravitating and so you imagine that all the galaxies are kind of being pulled back in. And the, the question of whether the pulling back in is enough to halt the expansion, turn it around, and lead us to an ultimate crunch is an open question. But at the very least, you would expect that the expansion should be slowing down. It might be slowing down but won't ever stop. We might continue to expand forever. But it appears now that we're undergoing a period of inflation again that the rate of expansion is actually picking up as though some cosmic field is condensing and adding energy. Well, we don't really know what's going on. It's not the Higgs. The mathematics of the Higgs doesn't explain this new expansion, this new inflation. The buzzword on the street in particle physics and cosmology is dark energy. It acts as though there's a new supply of energy in the universe and we really don't know what that dark energy is. So dark energy is even more mysterious than dark matter. You could imagine some sort of particle physics explanation, but we don't have one today. Again, active field of research. 
So let me, let me summarize with the state of the world today in cosmology. We have compelling evidence for a Big Bang about 15 billion years ago, which involved an inflationary period, very high temperatures, particle physics in action, and then everything just proceeds according to the known laws of physics. The universe cools, the Higgs field is present in the universe today, the galaxies form, we see the remnants of all this stuff. It's a nice picture, it's not complete, and there are probably some holes and gaps and maybe even some fundamental ideas still missing. If you go back early enough, the temperature gets high enough that you expect really complete unification. In fact, you expect at some ultra early stage of this Big Bang that we get beyond what the standard model can tell us. Once you get up to energies, which I call the Planck energy, extraordinarily high temperatures, the standard model physics begins to break down and we really need something more fundamental like string theory to really tell us how this story begins. And so I think the goal, the hope, is that all of this stuff is going to tie together in a neat bundle. String theory, standard model physics, and Big Bang cosmology to form a coherent picture of the cosmos as a whole.